Are you pro-human or are you anti-human? I'm gonna say it right now, real clear. I love everybody, no matter what color your beautiful skin is, whether you're a pink polka dotted speckled creature like me or whether you got beautiful ebony skin or you got pure, beautiful porcelain skin, what I care about your heart and your guts and your mind. And you're under attack by these Satanists and they wanna kill you and they wanna kill your children. And I say we set our differences aside and I say we come together and we beat these people and we smash their technocracy and we build the future together and we can do anything with our real diversity. Not because I'm some angel, not because I wanna save you, but because I'm following God's plan and I know we've got to save each other. I need you, you need me. We can't beat this without each other. We gotta do it. We can't let these monsters win. And that's why the enemies of humanity hate us so much because we love God and God loves humanity. And I am a human supremacist. 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 That term will be the future war with the robots and the AI. What you're hearing now is the entire future and everything they tried to stop us from doing. Stay with us. And speaking of AI, yes, I indeed use Eleven Labs to record an AI voice, but the scripts are written by me, Mushmouth Joe. I assure you that everything you see and hear has been and is being presented to you by a living, breathing human being. Now that we have that out of the way, let's watch the rest of Owen Schroyer's testimony. All rise. Four fifty-nine District Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Maya Jerry Gamble presenting. Good morning. Good morning, You may be seated. And I think Mr. Reynolds are just ready when you are. Like when were we? I remember. When we left off yesterday, you were discussing your um, entrance into political commentary on the radio in St. Louis. Yes. Um, let's move on from there. How did you come to work uh, at InfoWars and move to Austin, Texas? There were a couple of videos that I was featured in on their YouTube channel at the time that had gotten millions of views and they liked my commentary in the videos. They thought I had potential as a street reporter and ultimately offered me a job. What year was that? 2016. Can you describe the, the work environment for the members of the jury? For the most part, it's uh, pretty chaotic, um, especially when you're dealing with a 24-hour news cycle with news constantly breaking and Everybody is pretty much on call, in a way, 24 hours, and you have to be able to wear multiple hats, or in other words, be able to do multiple jobs at uh, any given time. And uh, would you say that uh, InfoWars is more like broadcast television or more like talk radio? Definitely more like talk radio. Who, um, who do you work with? Give us a sense of who your staff is and how that, that works. I have a crew of probably about six people that work on my show. Um, everybody has different roles, yet everybody's kind of expected to do everything. There's an individual that brings videos in and puts them on a list for me. There's an individual that plays the videos on the air when I go to them. There is an individual who's in charge of getting guests lined up for the show and then making sure that they're on. There is an individual who's running the sound, making sure my audio levels are good on the air, in my ear, with the guests, with the clips. And uh, we also have somebody that takes notes on the show as well, so that when we're going back later to write titles, we recall what it is we were discussing. Generally, would you describe the people who work at InfoWars as happy? Yes. And. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about, about the group of people who work there. 
what they're like. As part of what I like about InfoWars, I've worked in a lot of different media capacities. I've, I've worked for CBS, I've worked for other big companies, and the thing that I like the most about InfoWars is the people there are really down to earth. Um, they're just they're just normal people. There's not you know millionaires walking around thumbing their nose, chin in the air. Um, it's just down to earth people that I feel like I can relate to. Is it a diverse group? Yes, I would say so. In terms of their ideology? Yeah, in fact, there's people that work on my crew that probably don't see eye to eye with most of the things I say, but we get along. And in terms of their gender? We have women and men. There's no, we've got plenty of women that work for us. How about in terms of race? Very mixed, very mixed. Um, do you enjoy your job? I'm happy with what I'm doing. It's been my dream to host a talk show. It's not easy all the time, but um, I, I am proud of my work and I do enjoy it. What would you say your mission is as a talk show host? My personal mission is to be the best talk show host that I can be. What would you say InfoWars' mission is? InfoWars' mission is an open platform to tell the truth and also be an open platform for others to tell the truth or how they see things and then let the audience decide whether they agree or disagree. On, on that topic, um, I think you testified yesterday that when you're on the air, you have articles that are in front of you? Correct. Tell us more about that. My average process for preparing for a show probably takes 10 hours, and that's just going through news literally from the minute I wake up to the minute I get on air. That's my aggregation process. Once again, and it is posted on the door, all phones, etc., must be turned off or silent before you walk in the courtroom. And while we're going over rules, I apologize, Mr. Troyer. No gum. No sodas, coffee, water, that's it. No photographs, no video, no recording, no re-streaming the live stream without prior written permission from me. Thank you, I apologize for the interruption. Not at all. Um, I can pick that up where I left off. Please do. So um, I'm aggregating news all day, all night, and then about two or so hours before the show, I decide what news I'm going to take to air and then I have it all laid out on my desk. When you're watching the show, you can see how it's all laid out on my desk. And as the show goes on, you can see how slowly but surely there's less and less. And then throughout the broadcast, news is breaking and the crew is bringing me the breaking news in stacks and putting that in front of me as well. Now, in the video clip we watched yesterday about um, the, the Zero Hedge article, you mention the, the the publisher. You say Zero Hedge is reporting. Is that a common practice to mention the name of the publication first? Yeah, I try to habitually read the name of the news organization before I cover it. So, like for example, if it's a New York Times story, I say, and now this in the New York Times, and then I cover the story, much like what we saw in the video yesterday. And is there a particular reason why you do that? Yes, that way people can find the story that I'm talking about and they can also decide whether they trust the source or not. So, uh, for example, somebody might choose to give a different level of trust to the New York Times than to the National Enquirer? Yes. In your time on the air, can you cite a story that no one else was covering that InfoWars covered that you're very proud of? Uh, there's a lot of them, but the biggest one would have to be probably the Jeffrey Epstein uh, Trafficking Network. Tell us more about that. How that came to be covered by Info. So, as long as I could remember, uh, InfoWars was talking about Jeffrey Epstein. I'm sure many of you are aware of the name now. Uh, perhaps most people weren't five, ten years ago. And we would talk about how he was connected to a bunch of elite politicians, elite members of Hollywood, and how they had this island. And we were always covering that. And I remember there was a 
clip from ABC News's Amy Robach in which she said on a hot mic how she was told they're not allowed to cover the Jeffrey Epstein story. I've had the story for three years. I've had this interview with Virginia Roberts. We would not put it on the air. Um, first of all, I was told, who's Jeffrey Epstein? No one knows who that is. This is a stupid story. Um, then the palace found out that we had her whole allegations about Prince Andrew and threatened us a million different ways. Um, we were so afraid we wouldn't be able to interview Kate I and Will say, oh, that we that, that also quashed the story. Yeah. And then um, and then Alan Dershowitz was also implicated in because of the planes. She told me everything. She had pictures. She had everything. She was in hiding for 12 years. We convinced her to come out. We convinced her to talk to us. Um, it was unbelievable what we had. Clinton. We had everything. I, I tried for three years to get it on to no avail and now it's all coming out and it's like these new rel revelations and I freaking had all of it. I, I, I'm so pissed right now. Like every day I get more and more pissed because I'm just like, oh my God, we, it was, um, what, what we had was unreal. Other women backing it up. Hey, yep. Brad Edwards, the attorney three years ago saying like, aunt, like we, there will come a day when we will realize Jeffrey Epstein was the most prolific all this country has ever known. And, I had it all three years ago. We were covering it for decades. I'd like to uh, change gears and uh, discuss uh, uh, one of your coworkers. Are you familiar with a man named Robert Jacobson? Yes. How do you know Robert Jacobson? He worked at InfoWars when I was first hired. And what did he do there? Uh, sound editor, and um, I think he was maybe doing a little production work too, maybe getting guests lined up. How closely did you work with him? Not too closely other than one assignment that I had that uh, I had to turn over to him for final production. And how did that work out? Not well, actually. Can you tell us what happened? Sure. Um, I would cut about a 60 second just kind of daily news clip you may hear it similar things on talk radio whatever the breaking news is you know president biden signed this executive order or this or that just 60 seconds and i would I'd cut that audio and there was a video that went along with it and <coughs> once i cut the audio in the video i would turn it over to rob jacobson and it needed to be done by 11 a.m so that it could be ready for the 11 a.m broadcast the last time I ever saw or spoke to Rob, he was late. He was constantly late. It was constantly a struggle because I was still new at the time, and I didn't want to look like I wasn't doing my job. So when he kept showing up late, I instead took the audio and video to a different producer who happened to be Daria, who you guys are aware of. And I said, hey, Rob isn't here again today. Can I give you this to get ready for the show? She said, yes, absolutely, So I wanted to make sure it was on. Rob showed up late that day, started going on a tirade, started saying that I set him up to be fired, all of which is completely untrue. Um, during that tirade, Alex Jones said, hey, look, if you're not in a good place, why don't you just take some time off? Just, just take a couple weeks off, come back when you're in a better mental place. He didn't accept that. He continued to rant and rave, and ultimately was fired. Switching gears again, um, yesterday we watched a um, a news special by Megyn Kelly about Alex Jones. Are you familiar with generally with that news special that Megyn Kelly produced? Yes. Um, were you in it? Yes. Can you um, tell us about? how that was filmed. I don't recall the amount of days she spent in our studios, but it was at least an entire day. Um, she had a big news crew with her, and she was pretty much filming everything. She asked a lot of people for interviews, including myself, but uh, it was a very lengthy process. It was at least a day. It, it, she may have been there more than a day. I don't recall. I just remember she was there uh, a, a significant amount of time, more so than people normally are when they come there to shoot specials. About how long did she spend interviewing Alex Jones? At least a full day, I'd say. Um, 
when you watched that uh, news segment when it aired, uh, did it appear edited to you? Yes. And how so? Well, she took probably maybe 10 seconds of the five minute or so interview with me, but that was kind of expected. I think the more shocking edit was what she did to Alex, um, where say she sat down with Alex for three hours, she cut up that interview to fit, I believe it was about a 15 minute segment, and the editing was done so that what Alex Jones was saying in the final piece was not actually in linear fashion. So she kind of cut it up so that he, he something he said afterwards he would now say before. And Alex's crew just so happened to film it for themselves. So when we did a side-by-side -side comparison of what aired on Megyn Kelly versus what we had, which was the raw recording, we realized that it was extremely highly edited. Was it edited to from your perspective, put Alex Jones in a negative light? Yes. Your, uh, the piece we watched yesterday, which is part of what brings us to this trial today, um, before you went on the air with the Zero Hedge article that discussed Mr. Hessel, did you discuss it with Alex? No. Did he have any idea that you were going to air that? No. Having read that article now, what does that article say about InfoWars' position about whether children die at Sandy Hook? I know that it mentions Alex, um, and if you would like, I can read directly from the article uh, in their mention of Alex. Um, it says here on page three, Jones, that's Alex Jones, implored NBC not to air the segment on Father's Day, citing the inappropriate timing and then again, Alex is mentioned in page four. Alex Jones' official position is that he believes children died in the shooting. Uh, in fact, during a 2014 account of a hearing before the Newtown Board of Education, a journalist did not dispute that Adam Lanza had perpetuated the shooting. I want to frame this question for you appropriately. The court has already ruled that your broadcast was defamatory. That's not a question for us. The question I have for you is, did you intend your broadcast to be defamatory of Mr. Hessler? Absolutely not. If someone saw your piece and that resulted in Mr. Heslin losing a business opportunity or not getting a line of credit or being refused membership in an organization, or being held in disregard by his neighbors, how would that make you feel? I think that that would be a real shame. That's the witness. Thank you. Mr. Rivera? Mr. Schroyer, are you really going to sit here and tell this jury that it was unfair that the Megyn Kelly was a highly edited clip? I don't believe I used those words. Are you going to complain? That, that video, the Megyn Kelly piece, was highly edited? It was highly edited, yes. Do you see at all the irony of you sitting in that chair after the court has found what you did was defamatory and complained that the Megyn Kelly clip was too edited? No. You don't see the irony in that at all? The fact that you played 30, 40 seconds of Dr. Carver's 15-minute interview, the fact that the McDonald family interview was literally cut in the middle of the answer, to fit a narrative, to fit an agenda? You don't see the irony. I mean, it might be ironic if we sued Megyn Kelly for $150 million. Would you like to see something even more ironic than that? Well, check this out. Uh, it's all fascinating, and we're not done with Jeffrey Epstein. I can tell you that for a fact. Can't tell you how I know, but I can tell you for a fact, we're gonna hear a lot more about Jeffrey Epstein in the coming year, uh, and you may be even hearing from him directly. More on that as I'm allowed to tell you. Negative dings on credit reports happen to all sorts of people from all socioeconomic backgrounds. Megyn Kelly has not only decided to cover one of Alex Jones's most famous conspiracy theories, but she also cut to a promotion directly afterward. What a hypocritical skank. No more questions. All right, Mr. Reynolds. We had some uh, questions about the platforming. Um, Let's go, John. 
sustained. Well, never mind, I guess. No further questions. Thank you. All right. How often does Alex Jones, Free Speech Systems, Infowars have regrets about something that was claimed or suggested on their shows? Not very often. How often are audience callers or guests advised to fact check their claims? Sometimes. Does InfoWars ever feel guilty of promoting false beliefs conveyed by mentally unstable or politically extreme individuals and groups? When we make mistakes, we apologize. Who produced your show about the Megyn Kelly interview? That was the Alex Jones show. It was not my show, and I'm not sure who was producing it at the time. Did your producer vet the sources that you used prior to airing? I cannot say. Should the producer vet the sources that you use prior to airing? Yes. Do you ask or check with Alex Jones about your topics before you go to air? No. Do you take the time to make sure what you are going to talk about on your show is true? Yes. How many times do you go to air on your show in one day? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question, Your Honor. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't. Um, rewrite it for you so if you don't understand we'll move on okay is there anything you would recant about the Sandy Hook story if so why I would have just not covered it at all it was not a subject material that I was familiar with and that four minutes of my life has caused tremendous negative effects on my career and livelihood from your opinion, are there any changes the company is making because of this incident? Yes. Are you all considering it a learning experience? Yes. When you reported on the Zero Hedge article, were you questioning the parent actually holding his child or Megyn Kelly's facts? I was questioning Megyn Kelly's facts. In your opinion, is the judge a hired actor? Please answer yes or no. No. In your opinion, are some or all of the jurors hired actors? Please answer yes or no. No. To your knowledge, has anyone that is currently working at InfoWars attended college for journalism and successfully graduated? I attended college for media studies. I'm not sure if that counts, and I did graduate. Aside from myself, I'm not sure. Are there any <coughs> motives to running inflammatory stories that are monetarily based? No. You stated you could have done a better job in the presentation and representation of the broadcast. That's the one we watched yesterday, number 23. What, if anything, have you changed as part of your preparation and presentation of content in broadcasts since? I am a lot less likely, if at all, to ever take something that is handed to me while on air and go straight to air with it. Is it your position that you believe that free speech systems and infowars should be exempt from any consequences for recklessly airing harmful lies because you, quote, didn't mean to harm, unquote? I think that there should be a fair application when it comes to media outlets reporting things that are not true. What consequences would you expect for a company that purposefully aired harmful content? I think that there is laws that already constitute this on the books, like it's my understanding there can't be a defamation lawsuit unless you mention someone's name specifically, so I would say that the laws on the books properly applied equally are fair. What is your definition of a conspiracy theorist? An individual who doesn't trust the government doesn't trust the mainstream news and would rather do their own investigating and understands that there's a lot of corruption in the world and just wants to figure out why. Can you elaborate on why CNN is a conspiracy theorist and you are not? CNN ran with many stories that turned out not to be true. For example, the big story of Russian collusion, which never happened, is one example. Um, Jesse Smollett claiming that he was attacked with a noose over his neck. It turned out that was fake as well. So those are just 
two small examples. CNN also goes to basements in Atlanta where they pretend they're in Kuwait getting bombed by Chris Jaco. So uh, those are a few examples. It was mentioned that you and InfoWars are airing opinion, your opinions about the trial while it's been going on. What have you been saying? I'd have to go back and check the record. I, I don't recall everything I said. All right. May this witness be released from the rule and any subpoenas. No, Your Honor. So this is Rob Jacobson. He's a disgruntled ex-employee of InfoWars. He admitted in this deposition that he went out of his way to contact the plaintiffs so he could testify in the trial. His claim is that he felt he could help to bring Jones to justice because of his guilt over what he did while working at InfoWars. But we heard earlier that this guy didn't show up in time to do his production work for the video Jones is being sued for. Which means if he hadn't been late, this would all be his fault instead of Daria's. Not to mention that he worked for InfoWars for well over 10 years. If he thought they were so dangerous, why did he continue his employment for so many years only to expose Jones after getting fired for being a wacko? Plus, they didn't even bother to bring this guy in because that would actually be a liability for the plaintiffs. Just like the way they canceled Megyn Kelly's subpoena to keep the exculpatory evidence out of this trial while leaving the defense no ability to counter in any way. All right, obviously you can't ask him any questions because he's not here, so we're just going to move on to the next witness. The defense can't cross-examine? What a shame, man. Yes, Your Honor, got one more demo uh, video. It's going to be Dan and Don. So then we have another disgruntled ex-employee who conveniently cannot be cross-examined either. This one is disgruntled because he still believes Halbig was right. And in this deposition, he seemed to believe these evil personal injury lawyers were his friends, even though they treated him like a complete moron. So after that load of shit, the plaintiffs brought in this guy. Uh, Fred Zip, 67 years old, retired, daily newspaper journalist and educator. He's their journalistic integrity expert. He spent time with some of the evidence and fact-checked it. Want to take a wild guess at what tools he used to do his fact-checking? PolitiFact Snopes had been engaged on a lot of the um, issues that uh, Mr. Jones was raising. Um, Just to be clear, when you say Snopes and PolitiFact, what are those? I'll tell you myself. They're both garbage. I can't even believe he said that with a straight face. Folks, if you've ever fact-checked these particular fact-checkers, you know just how full of shit they are and why you should do your own fact-checking instead. If you weren't aware of that, you just need to check all sources for everything you read, and you'll be just fine. You'll learn to sniff out the bullshit quite easily. Just the fact that this guy doesn't know that tells me I'm actually a much better fact-checker than this guy will probably ever be. And I think everyone knows I'm a total moron. So that means this guy is not really an expert witness. Those of us who have been around for a while can remember uh, Walter Cronkite being handed a piece of paper saying that President Kennedy had died and then saying that. So in this segment, I was going to show you the footage of Walter Cronkite announcing the assassination of President Kennedy. But I can't do that here on YouTube because apparently Sony Music Entertainment owns the footage and doesn't allow others to use even 20 seconds of it. So if that 20 seconds is important to you, you'll have to go to Rumble or Odyssey for the original cut of this video. Apologies, man. The reason I wanted to play it was because immediately following Cronkite's special news bulletin, there was an advertisement for Nescafe. So CBS was selling coffee while promoting a conspiracy theory about the president? Holy shit, that's reckless. Cronkite should have been ashamed of himself for being a member of Bohemian Grove. What does it mean to be a, a citizen or an independent journalist? Uh, that would be a somebody who engages in journalistic activity, uh, but independent of any news organization. And um, obviously there's no licensing requirement in order to be a journalist, true? First Amendment, I can't do that. That's exactly right. And the, the SBJ Code of Ethics, I mean, this this doesn't have the force of law, does it? It does not. Because if it did, it would violate the Constitution, right? 
I'm not a lawyer. For me, this is what actually matters. This code of journalistic ethics is not legally binding because it's meant for the standard basic media, not regular citizens. Alex Jones is not exactly standard basic media. And if the standard basic media for normies actually followed this journalistic code of ethics, there would be no need for Alex Jones in the first place. What I mean is, who would listen to InfoWars if the basic bitch media was doing its job to the ridiculously high standard that they're expecting from Jones? InfoWars exists because the media sucks and no one expects perfection. But Jones sure is better than the boring vanilla media. So would you agree that citizen uh, journalists uh, have been, our independent journalists have been responsible for breaking some of the most important stories uh, of the last decade? Um, I'm not sure I would agree with that. All right, that's it. I'm done with this fucking guy. Next, they snuck in another deposition, and I don't even know why, because this guy didn't say anything at all. I don't recall. 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 Not that I recall. I don't remember. I, well, I don't understand the question. I don't understand that question. I don't understand the question. Can you rephrase it? I don't understand that question. Uh, wait, don't you understand about it? I just don't understand the question. I don't understand the question. In your view. Then I don't understand the question. I don't understand the question. I don't understand the question, to be honest. Not that I recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. This is very hypothetical. I don't know. I don't know. I really can't say I blame the guy. This trial is rigged, so why even bother? Next up is this bleach blonde wacko who has been indoctrinated by the worst of the worst when it comes to education. I uh, have a BA in film studies from Columbia University. I I'm very proud to have gone there. It's considered one of the top universities in the country. So I have my master's of science in the social science of the internet from Oxford University. <laughs> it's, it's considered one of the top, uh, top research universities in the world. I hate the way she says everything with a high-pitched tone at the end of every sentence. It's really annoying. So she's an expert on conspiracy theories, allegedly. I've been a conspiracy theorist since before she was born, so as far as I'm concerned, she doesn't know shit about Dick. This bitch goes on and on about all the research and studies she's been involved with that scientifically prove when you perceive a national news story incorrectly, you actually injure people. It's a huge load of horse shit, so we're not gonna waste much time with her. The best I can tell, Lil Mark found this chick on Twitter and slid into her DMs. He even asked her to testify about her Twitter account. Are you, are you popular on Twitter? <laughs> Define popular. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I you post have, on Twitter. <laughs> sure, let me say, you have, you have an active Twitter account where thousands of people follow you, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, is that your personal account? That's your professional account? That's my personal account. Okay. Do you do some political punditry on there? Yes. All her research and findings, as well as her opinions, are mired in leftist partisan bias. She doesn't come right out and say it, but she is fully advocating for censorship of unapproved ideas. There's a few things I think that are important. The, the first is that the current media environment online is what we call an attention economy, uh, which means that everyone is vying for views, for clicks, either to translate those into um, into revenue through advertising or just to translate it into influence, right? To get as many eyeballs in front of your page as possible. And so sometimes that translates into what what we call clickbait, which means that you you know have a really salacious headline and someone clicks into it, it's not actually reflected in the story. Um, but sometimes that's reflected more in um, the content itself and the fact that people try to publish really salacious content to get those views. Um, but the other big way that I would describe the media environment right now is that on the internet, people are able to form really insular communities, uh, bubbles, in which they reinforce each other's fears and anxieties and biases about the world. Um, and often there are opportunists who will come in and stoke those fears as well. Uh, in, in in all of your professional work with InfoWars and during your work in your case, 
uh, do you believe Mr. Jones is one of those individuals? I do. Okay. Folks, I don't care what anyone thinks about what gets posted online. I am against censorship, period. I don't consider myself an absolutist, but I was against censorship when the conservatives were locking up record store owners for selling a two live crew album in 1989. And I continue to be against it today when the liberals and conservatives team up to silence people. The current form of censorship isn't even necessarily about the specific words you use. It's based on the opinions you express. And those opinions are formed based on your very perception. So your perception is under attack by wackos like this chick who believe your ideas and thoughts actually injure people, which is completely insane. If you don't like people forming opinions about you, then how about not seeking national attention over the death of your child? You can't just force people to give a shit. You've got to give them a reason, man. The career of Alex Jones best illustrates the mainstreaming of anti-government conspiracism. Uh, and then it skips a bit and says, his improvised rants mixing right-wing and left-wing fears of government overreach won him a large fan base, and he moved to conservative talk radio in 1996. Um, and then in the next paragraph, there's a quote that says, though he had a dedicated following before 2009, Jones's popularity really began to surge when Obama won the presidency. Jones cleverly inserted Obama into longstanding American conspiracy narratives about elite rulers. Um, and then at the end of that paragraph, it says, um, Infowars began promoting even more conspiracy theories, including most notoriously, that the massacre of 20 children and six adults at Sandy Hook Elementary School was a government hoax designed to take Americans' guns. And then uh, the very last uh, sentence of this article says, as distrust in conspiracism became mainstreamed, figures like Alex Jones moved from the paranoid fringe to advising those at the center of power. Uh, I noticed in the part that you had read that it had discussed um, about how Mr. Jones writes mix right-wing and left-wing ideas uh, about the government. And, and, you know, I think, you know, it, can you explain a little bit how Mr. Jones is outside of the traditional left-right mold, why he incorporates both of those? Yes, absolutely. His, his politics have changed over time, um, but in general, he, um, he tries to find kind of... Uh, he, he claims that there are conspiracies regardless of who's in power. Um, and so during the Bush era, he was ver a very big proponent of um, conspiracies about September 11th and was very critical about uh, George W. Bush in general. Um, when Obama came into power, he was incredibly critical of Obama and um, developed a range of conspiracy theories about him. Uh, including in part the Sandy Hook conspiracy theory, um, and uh, it goes on from there. Uh, now, he has been quite close with, uh, with Donald Trump, who has been on his show, so he doesn't focus his conspiracy theories against uh, President Trump, but he continues to believe that in other facets of government um, there are still conspiracies, including other Republicans. So it's not really a... Um, a partisan divide that he's, he's promoting. Sure, sure. I'm just going to say it. This bitch has no idea what she's talking about. First of all, this article claimed that Jones mixed left and right wing conspiracy theories together, then started conservative talk radio. This doesn't even make sense, man. If you think Jones is right wing or using both sides just to grift people, I would mention that every single president in my life had the exact same foreign policy regardless of which political party they claimed, all of them, except Trump. That's why Jones suddenly began supporting a presidential candidate. It's because there's something different about Trump. And I understand that people who continue to believe in the two-party grift may never come around to this way of thinking. But I have a right to my opinions too, Jack. So I'll let the two live crew tell you what you can do. Then she wrote an article about Alex Jones's reach and influence, citing a statistic study, which is the origin of the 24% theory, that a quarter of the world is completely brainwashed by info wars. 
it's quite a conspiracy theory. Yes, the poll found that 24% of Americans believed that Sandy Hook had been at least partially or fully staged. Okay. This study only used a section of 1,000 people, which is the bare minimum as far as samples go. Plus, the survey was done by telephone. Do you answer phone calls from randos? Because I'm willing to bet they didn't even get 500 people to answer. Scraping the bottom of the barrel, aren't we? 24%. I just don't believe you, Miss Piggy. Miss Lewis, thank you so much for your time today. I don't have any more questions now, but I'll pass it with you. All right, Mr. Reno. How much are you being paid to testify, Miss Lewis? Um, I was paid a retainer uh, when I was first hired that was, I believe, $3,000 for about 20 hours of work. Um, I, I have gone well beyond the 20 hours, uh, but this is a, a, these issues are really important to me, so, you know, I guess that's not what it's about, I guess. Fair enough. These issues are really important to you, right? Yes. And um, that's because uh, you've made your, your career studying people you hate, right? Not always, no. Well, you hate Alex Jones, don't you? I... That's a yes. I would say that personally I have come to be really disturbed <clears throat> by... Um, what I have watched, I started out my research not knowing anything about Alex Jones, and so when I go into research, I don't go in with any preconceived notions, but um, through the course of watching, I would say, hundreds of hours of his content. Objection, non response. So the question was just, you hate Alex Jones, don't you? Yeah, I, I guess it's a little more complicated. I would say that I've come to think that he's really harmful. And he's not the only person that you think is really harmful in the media sphere, is he? Correct. And uh, you have a Twitter handle, at Becca Lou? Yes. And you speak about things that you're passionate about, right? I do. And one of the things that you've said is that you believe that the entire Republican Party is a white supremacist organization, right? Uh, you would have to show me that tweet. I tweet a lot. <laughs> do you not recall tweeting that? No. But I do tweet a lot. I'm not saying I didn't tweet it, I just... Well, let me refresh your recollection. Oh, yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, I uh, very... This seems like something I could have tweeted. I can't confirm that I did because I don't remember. And I, I haven't seen this earlier in the trial, so I can't confirm it hasn't been tampered with. It seems like something I reasonably may have tweeted. I'm not sure. And if you tweeted it, it's because you really felt that way, right? Yes. And um, you say the Republican Party has been a white supremacist party since the 1960s. I looked all over her Twitter account for that tweet to no avail. I guess she deleted it after realizing what a hypocrite she's become. I also noticed that there really aren't many tweets at all for someone who supposedly tweets a lot. She must have purged everything or started a new account or something. That's or, not I'm sorry. evidence. Hey. Would it you be know fair? you can't read things that aren't in evidence out loud to the jury, <coughs> and she just said she can't confirm that it hasn't been altered in any way. So the jury is instructed to strike everything Mr. Renal said after the witness's answer. Try again. Would, uh, would something like the Republican Party has been a white supremacist organization since the 1960s be the kind of thing you would say? Yes. And so uh, I take it you believe that Eisenhower was a white supremacist. He's got you there, bitch. Not necessarily. However, it was in the 1950s that... Um, Objection, non-response. Um, overruled. It's not non-responsive. I take it you believe he was a white supremacist is a yes or no question. Well, can I clarify um, my, my answer earlier? Mr. Bankston will have a chance to ask you questions after I'm done. You can clarify with him. Okay. Um, so, um, Gerald Ford, white supremacist. Your Honor, I'm just going to object to relevance at this point. Why are we even talking about that? Goes to bias, Your Honor. Against the Republican former presidents of the 70s, I don't see the relevance at all. Um, you're going to have to ask some other questions to to bring this into what we're doing here today, so sustain. Have you heard of the term confirmation bias? Yes, I have. And confirmation bias is that when you have a, a particular idea about how, as a researcher, how something is going to turn out before you begin doing your research, 
you end up simply confirming what you already believe, right? Yes, absolutely. It's something I take very seriously. When you were testifying earlier, you said yes. that before Mr. Bankston ever hired you, you'd already watched tons of Alex Jones oh. content. So, sorry for interrupting. Yes. So in terms of testifying here today, you had already <laughs> developed an opinion as to Alex Jones before you were ever hired by Mr. Bankston. Yeah, that's correct. It was based on hundreds of hours of research. And in fact, Mr. Bankston came to you because he knew you were going to say what you've said here today, that Mr. Jones is a dangerous guy. Yes, because it's based on my research. Well, it's because that's what you thought before and that's what you think now. It's not because of the work you did in this case, is it? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, I had already done previous hours upon hours of research on Alex Jones, so I assume, I can't, I can't speak to exactly what Mr. Bankston was thinking, but I assume he thought I was already a knowledgeable party and that my opinions were informed by the research I'd done. The, uh, the poll we were looking at earlier, Exhibit 16, um, what was the sample size of the poll? I don't remember offhand. I would have to go and read it. You think that's important? Yes. Wasn't that something you should have looked at before you came up here to testify? To I did look at it. Uh, I also am not going to remember offhand every single piece of methodology of every single one of the 1,500 pages I read. Well, we, we, we just talked about it. Would it be fair to say, if you remember, that it was less than 1,000 people? Uh, that may be fair. I can take a look if you would like me to. Have yeah. you ever heard the term clickbait? Yes. Uh, for example, five foods that are sure to shred body fat? Yes. And another form of clickbait is 24% of Americans believe Sandy Hook never happened, right? Well, that depends. Well, it's the kind of catchy title that people like putting on their polls so that lots of people are going to click on them and read articles about them, aren't they? The way I understand clickbait is that it's misleading. And in this case, that would be an accurate representation of what was measured in this poll. With a sample size of less than 1,000 people. Uh, sample size is not always the most important factor. You need to make sure it's statistically significant. Um, so this is, I don't want to get too into the weeds of statistics, but just by saying that it's less than 1,000, that's not really saying anything about the accuracy because uh, things that are sizes of 1,000 can be statistically significant. Even though we all know there's no way they got all 1,019 people on the fucking phone. Get real, man. Okay, so it's fair to say you just didn't take, check your sources on this poll. It, sure. Ms. Lewis, why don't you tell us, since we're getting into this, exactly how many people were to be in the poll? It was, well, on page three, they talk about 310 and then another 709. So it was over 1,000. And 310 and 709, those are, uh, I think that's 1,019. 310 were interviewed in person, right? No. They were conducted on landlines. Oh, sorry. And the others were by cellular phone? Yes. So none of these interviews were even conducted in person, right? That's not considered relevant in polls like this. And uh, there is also in this same poll, and this is you know what they're saying, um, we were talking about margin of error. Yes. Does it say right there on page three, it says... Uh, Survey results are also subject to non-sampling error. This kind of error, which cannot be measured, arises from a number of factors, including, but not limited to, non-response, eligible individuals refusing to be interviewed, question wording, the order in which questions are asked, and variations among interviewers. So that's about all I can take from this snooty skank. The only other thing that happened was the announcement of yet another bankruptcy. So I'll be back with day five as soon as it's ready. But I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go to bed. Thank you. Thanks for watching.